So my name is Kristen Richardson, and I am with Long Point Basin Land Trust. Uh, this is actually our fourth webinar and eighth overall Explore the Outdoors event for 2022. If you haven't already, um, and maybe you have when you registered for this presentation, uh, please check out our events page on the website to see all the other events we have lined up for this year and uh, spread the word if you see any topics that you know someone might be interested in joining us with. So just very briefly, Long Point Basin Land Trust is a charitable non-government organization with the mission to protect and restore functioning ecosystems in the Long Point Basin. Uh, and that's a geographic area that's located in the Central Carian Carolinian region. And we achieve this mission through land securement, habitat restoration, research, and outreach. Um, we do a lot of other things, uh, events, um, uh, tours of our nature reserves. So please sign up uh, to our newsletter, join us on social media, and that's where you can see everything that we have going on. And speaking of nature reserves, this is the map of the 13 that we currently protect. Uh, they total 341 hectares. Uh, all of them are located in Norfolk County and seven of them are open to the public and have, or we are currently in the process of developing a formal trail system. So these provide opportunities for people to connect with the environment through hands-on and outdoor experiences. Again, visit our website for more information and, and location details of the nature reserves this year in the area and would like to check them out. And just very quickly, I'm gonna promote two more upcoming events. Both will also be virtual presentations, uh, both in August. One is on the recovery of Ontario's butterfly species at risk. Um, and the other is on Lake Erie's disappearing shore, shoreline. So for more information or to register for either or both, um, please visit the website. So without further ado, thank you again for joining us for tonight's talk on um, bats, the Canadian Bat Box Project and White Nose Syndrome. Uh, we're very delighted to be joined by Karen, who is currently a PhD candidate at Trent University. And uh, as she says, she is close to finishing. And she's examining the bat, bat box use in Canada through the Canadian Bat Box Project. She did her Bachelor of Science at Western University and her Master of Science at the University of New Brunswick. And she has previously worked for the Canadian Wildlife Federation, New Brunswick Museum, Ontario Parks, and the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So again, Karen, thank you for joining us tonight. And I, I must say, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, and uh, I'm, lot, I'm a lot closer to finishing now. Uh, <laughs> I got my defense date, uh, finally, so that's Good. Only Congratulations. next month, so I have to prepare for that. It'll be exciting to get it done. And before Karen takes over the screen, just so everyone knows, there's the chat box, so if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in there, and um, we'll save them to the end, and we'll be able to ask Karen all the questions then. All right, so hopefully this is working. It is, I can see it. Good. All right, so yeah, so today is all about bats. And usually my presentation runs a little long, so uh, I try not to dawdle too much. Um, but I just wanted to start with a really broad overview of bats. So there's over 1,400 species, uh, which is a lot of species. That makes up uh, about 25% of all mammal species. The only group it's uh, beaten by, if you will, is rodents, which are even, have even more species than bats. Um, and there's a huge range of sizes in bats. So these are two adult bats, two different species on the screen. So on your left is one of the fruit bats. Uh, there's a lot of those in Asia. Um, and you can see they get pretty big. They can have up to six foot wingspans uh, when they're full grown. Um, and uh, the other one, that's a full grown adult, if you can believe it, uh, being held in the, uh, what looks like a giant hand. And that is the bumblebee bat out in Thailand. It's actually the smallest bat in the world. And depending how you consider uh, small, it's the smallest mammal in the world as well. Uh, so quite the size range here. There's also quite a range in color. So when you think of bats, a lot of people think like, black, brown, and uh, that's all there is to it. But they can be white, for example. These are cute little bats are in Central America. And orange, one of my favorites, a painted bat in Asia. Uh, this is a panda bat. You can certainly see why it's called that. 
um, also not Canadian, that one's in Africa. The yellow winged bat, another African bat, you can see it's very brightly colored. So generally not what you think of when you think of bats. In terms of bat, what bats eat, a lot of them eat fruit, um, especially in the tropics, of course. Uh, another large segment are pollinators. They pollinate various uh, plants around the world. Some of them are carnivores. This one right here, you can see eating a frog or about to eat a frog. I was actually heard from the photographer that in this case, the frog escaped. That's kind of amazing given how close they are, but apparently it did. There's also some fishing bats. So kind of like an osprey, they will drag their feet through the water uh, to catch fish. And of course, vampire bats, uh, which you've probably all heard of. There's actually only three bat species in the world that uh, drink blood, and they're all located in Central America. So three out of over 1400 species, that's certainly not many. Uh, most bats eat insects though, and certainly all 18 species in Canada eat exclusively insects. So we don't have any fruit eaters here. We don't have any pollinators. There are some pollinators uh, in the Southern United States, but that's the closest they get to us. So all insectivores. And this is just sort of a, a rough uh, breakdown of uh, how bat species are grouped. So as I say, the insectivores down here make up over 70% bat species. The fruit eaters are the next big group, 18%. Carnivores, not so many. Uh, the fish eaters, not many. And the pollinators, again, not as many there, but that gives you a general sense of the, of the breakdown there. Um, in terms of the pollination, uh, you might have heard that bats pollinate agave, so that's responsible for making tequila. It pollinate wild bananas, avocados, coconuts, and when they eat fruit, um, they will fly off and poop out the seeds. So that helps with uh, spreading out some of these plant species such as the one listed there. And for the bats that eat insects, uh, a lot of them eat uh, crop pests. So insects that harm our agricultural food crops. And you can see the list of plants there that bats are involved in protecting through these uh, services of eating insects. Some of which are grown in Canada. Um, that's a, obviously a lot of which are not. <laughs> now, don't worry, in Canada, we also have a lot of colorful bats. We don't just have little brown bats. So the red bat there, that's probably our most dramatic species for coloration. Um, we do have those. It's one of our migratory bats. All three of these bats shown here are migratory species. So when I say migratory, that means they fly south for the winter. So they're not here uh, during the winter months. They take off and say goodbye Canadian winter and head south, possibly to as far as Mexico, where we're still learning about their uh, migratory routes because uh, they're really hard to study that way. So the red bat, the silver haired bat, and then the largest bat in Canada on the far right is the hoary bat. And large is relative, like we're talking maybe up to 40 grams, which, you know, it's not huge. This is a, one of the first red bat I ever caught, uh, which was actually just in 2019. It was very exciting. And it was especially exciting because this is a male. Unlike a lot of bat species, especially in Canada, uh, these red bats are sexually dimorphic. So you, you, if you like birds, you probably won't be uh, surprised to hear that the red bat or the uh, male bats are more brightly colored than the female bats. So that's a pretty uh, typical pattern. This is a big brown bat, a very common species in Ontario. Uh, this one was actually found flying around uh, a, a classroom uh, at the University of New Brunswick where I did my master's degree. And for some reason, they didn't really appreciate that. So we got called up and had to go fetch the little bat. And uh, uh, he or she, I don't remember which, uh, spent the winter in our lab being fed mealworms, which you can see right here. People quite like those. Uh, the other common species in Ontario, we have the tricolored bat up here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, this is the little brown bat there. Well, certainly was very common prior to white nose and it's, you can certainly still find them, which is nice. And the small footed bat and the Northern long eared bat down here. So when people ask me about big brown bats and little brown bats, like you say the big brown bats are bigger, but it's come, sometimes kind of hard to, uh, appreciate the size difference. So during one of my the winter surveys uh, in a cave in Ontario, I was luckily 
to find a big brown bat and a little brown bat roosting side by side by like this. So the two pictures, uh, it's the same two bats, it's just from a different angle, that's all. So you can really see the huge size difference here with the big brown bat roughly double the size of the little brown bat, which looks like a little baby, uh, but it's not. These are both full grown adults. So bat babies are born in June and they reach adult size about a month after they're born. So they grow pretty fast. So you're not gonna see a tiny baby in winter, which is when I took these pictures. You might also notice some other things uh, to differentiate these two, like the big brown bat has lovely glossy sort of chocolate colored fur. And the little brown bat, you know, it's kind of dull, a dull brown, not as glossy, not as chocolatey. So that's another way to identify the two. Big brown bats also have quite a distinctive uh, gland on their nose, on the snout, it's kind of swollen. Uh, the little brown bats don't have that either. So there's a few distinguishing features here, but uh, once you get to know bats a bit better, the size is, is a big one, because as you see, it's, it's a major difference between the two species. So I just wanna go over the life cycle quickly, and this is another big brown bat. Uh, this one was roosting in a tree in New Brunswick, uh, which is their natural roosting sites. So these bats are very long lived. Uh, so they like little brown bats are about the size of mice. They weigh about 10 grams. And uh, mice, of course, they live maybe one or two years in the wild, but little brown bats can live up to 35 years in the wild. So very different sort of lifestyle compared to mice. Um, they only have one pup per year. They, they will occasionally have twins, it happens, like just like with humans, but it's, it's not uh, the norm. Usually they just have one. So of course, when they're, they're getting exposed to a lot of different sources of mortality, if there's high mortality for whatever reason, they can't be like bunnies and suddenly produce these huge litters to uh, try to uh, revitalize the population. They can just, the females can just do one a year. So very slow reproduction. So uh, maternity roosts, uh, bats form these uh, to produce their pups. Pups are born in June. Um, and the females are pregnant in late May. So the females get together in these huge colonies. You generally do not find any males in these colonies and they like warm places. So like attics, uh, if you have a big colony in your attic, it's most likely a maternity roost. Um, and the maternity roosts are starting to break up now. So mid to late July, uh, they are starting to break up and go to the next stage. But I just want to talk a bit more about maternity colonies. So, uh, especially in regards to my bat fox project. So, of course, we as humans, we cut down a lot of trees in the landscape to make way for our cities and for agricultural purposes. And that's what bats traditionally use is really big hollow trees for their roosts. Uh, they roost under the bark, they roost in the big hollow spaces in trees, but when those are cut down and taken away, uh, they will often revert to human habitations like your house. And we can also put up bat boxes so that uh, hopefully they don't lose your attic, but they go into the boxes instead and try to replace some of these big trees that have been removed from the landscape. Um, particularly this is to help, of course, endangered bat species. So not all bat species use bat boxes. Some of them don't like them for some whatever reason. But little brown bats certainly will use them. Um, big brown bats like them. And in the West, like British Columbia, Yuma bats like them. Uh, but Yuma bats don't occur in Ontario. Um, but one of the reasons I was doing this project is there's really little data available for Canada on bat boxes, including what species use bat boxes. So these kind of studies have been done in the US, which is where most of our uh, recommendations on bat boxes come from. But of course, the Canadian climate is a little bit uh, different from parts of the US, especially uh, places like Texas and Florida, where a lot of this research has been done. So uh, we need to learn more about the Canadian landscape and what uh, bat species here use bat boxes. So we know a little bit just from little studies over the years, uh, geographically restricted studies. Uh, but there's a whole list of bat, bat species that use bat boxes in the US that haven't been found using them up here. And it's hard to tell if that's a biological pattern or if it's um, just because of lack of data. So that's one of the reasons we're doing this project. 
So these maternity colonies, they want really warm roofs, but not too warm. Um, and all the recommendations in Canada are usually trying to encourage uh, warm roofs, high temperatures in these boxes. The reasons the bats like these high temperatures is to save energy. If you're not putting all your energy into keeping warm, you can put it to, for instance, growth if you're a pup or lactation if you're a female. So warmer roofs are definitely better. However, in some parts of Canada, uh, including as far north as the Yukon, they have been documenting overheating events. So oh, it can be over 50 degrees, which is way too hot. You generally want somewhere between 27 and 38 degrees Celsius in your bat boxes, which is still pretty hot, but you don't want to go much above that. Um, you can tell if your bat box is too hot if you put a temperature logger in there to record the temperatures, which is part of what my project is doing. But in terms of bat behavior, you can also look at like this picture here that shows all the bat at the bottom of the box. They're trying to avoid the heat at the very top of the box. So generally, um, depending on the size of the box, bat boxes will have a gradient of temperatures with the hottest temperatures at the very top and then cooler temperatures at the bottom. So if bats are overheating, they're gonna to try to find those cool temperatures uh, at the bottom of the box or even leave the box to try to find uh, better temperatures. But of course the flightless pups um, can't find a different roost if it gets too hot. And generally the mortality events that have happened in Canada happen with the pups. Uh, so it's the pups that die because the, the adults are more able to, to leave and find somewhere else. So in terms of um, which bat species use bat boxes, um, yeah, it is mostly the little brown bats and the big brown bats in Canada, uh, well, especially in Ontario. Uh, but I am hoping to find some of these other species that have been documented using bat boxes in the US but haven't been documented using them up here. So uh, we'll find out. In terms of bat box designs, uh, there is a wide range uh, of different designs available out there, some of which are better than others. Um, and of course, we're still uh, learning more about what makes a good bat box. That's the point of doing this study. So on the le far left there, uh, that's a, actually a bat box made of concrete, which you might not have heard of before, uh, a rather unusual material here in North America. But they're actually quite common in Europe um, to make its they're mostly made out of not pure concrete, but what's called wood creep. So this is a mixture of concrete and wood. Um, and they're really good because the temperatures are quite stable inside. I, they don't fluctuate all over the place quite as much as wood does. Um, so, but they're not very common in Canada. I don't know of many of them. Um, and I certainly don't know where you can buy them uh, unless you go online and buy something from Europe. Uh, but here in Canada, it's mostly wood structures. So we have the big rocket boxes here. They, I guess they kind of look like uh, rockets. And then we have uh, some smaller boxes here, some of the larger ones. And this huge one here, this is what's called a bat condo. So that can hold several hundred bats. Uh, they're pretty expensive to make. This one's located in Pinery Provincial Park, uh, which isn't too far from Long Point, uh, if you're interested to see a bat condo. And this is actually a successful condo. They have, uh, I think the high count was 130. Uh, I'm not sure if they've done a count yet this year or not. And those are little brown bats using that particular condo. So if you're in the area, you might pop by and see it because it's kind of neat. So some of the goals of my project is to find out what types of bat boxes are used in Canada. So that's sort of a two prong a question actually. So used um, could mean which bat boxes, which box designs are people actually putting out and which designs are the bats using? So those are two different questions because there's a wide variety of designs out there, um, but the bats are only using a subset of them. And I also want to find out if the different bat species that use these boxes, if they prefer different designs. So perhaps little browns prefer something a little different from big brown bats. Um, so we're trying to look at that as well. And then, of course, documenting the microclimates in the boxes. So we mail um, participants little loggers that kind of look like an oversized credit card. And you just thread that up into your box and it records temperature and humidity. Um, so and as well as documenting which box designs have which microclimates, we can also see which ones overheat in which regions of Canada. 
Um, and this is a picture of a box in New Brunswick that I, I looked at. It's actually quite a big box. It's hard to tell from the photo, but it has a little brown bat maternity colony uh, that I visited in 2019. So actually it was post white nose syndrome. So this is a little brown bat with her pup. You can see the pup here, here's the head, there's the ears, and it's nursing. So that was a really fun find. So if you're interested in the project, uh, we don't give out bat boxes. So you should already have your own or, or plan to get your own uh, very soon. Um, but if you wanna learn more or uh, participate, uh, you just have to Google Canadian Bat Box Project. Uh, that's the easiest way to find us because the actual website uh, is, you don't wanna type that out, it's annoying. Uh, so you just have to Google that. So to register, you'll just have to fill in an online multiple choice survey about the physical properties of your bat box, like the size of it, uh, where it's placed, is it on a pole, is it on a building, that kind of thing. Um, but you don't have to participate if you want to uh, still get the newsletter. So I send out biannual newsletters uh, for the project. So it started in two, 2021. And it, this, we're halfway through by now. Uh, the project will end next year in 2023. But we'll certainly be looking for participants up to the end of 2023 summer. Um, so there's still time to, to sign up for sure. Uh, this is this project is in collaboration with the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Canadian Wildlife Federation, and there are way more people than I could ever name helping us uh, with this project across the country. I do have a few preliminary results that I went over in my newsletter. Um, preliminary, of course, because we still have a lot of data coming in. But for example, uh, one finding that we had was that bat boxes that are mounted on buildings are way more successful than boxes mounted on poles and especially trees. So bat boxes mounted on trees have a much lower success rate uh, compared to these other substrates. And the size of your box really matters. So big boxes are much better. They have much higher success rates, success rates than little boxes. So yeah, bigger is better. Don't believe what they tell you. And this is just a, a map of the location of my participants across the country. So I have about 1,200 people that have signed up so far. Of course, uh, Southern Ontario was well represented, uh, as is the Maritimes, actually. Uh, I've gotten a lot there. And um, this map is a little outdated. I just got back from fieldwork in the Yukon. So I have a lot more dots to put on this map, which is great. Uh, that was a fun, fun field trip for me. Um, I also like to push bat watch. So my project, it's only three years, so it's not that long. But bat watch is a much longer term uh, stewardship initiative uh, about bats. And it's also not bat box specific. So if you just see a bat, if you have bats in your attic, um, if you know about a roost in a tree, anything like that, you can uh, register it here at their website. Just look up batwatch.ca. Um, it has a lot of information about bats. If you want to learn more about bats in general, especially specific to your province, your area. Um, and you can see all the different roosts people have registered from across Canada uh, on this website. So this is a great long-term program. So moving on from maternity season, um, we enter swarming season and we're just getting into that season now at the end of July. So what swarming season is, is mating, also mating season. So this is the time of year that the bats mate. And this, the females actually store the sperm over the winter and don't get pregnant until the spring, which is uh, a little different from us. Uh, but at this time of year, uh, bats have started to go to their winter sites. So caves and mines underground where they're spending the winter. And during swarming, they'll visit multiple sites, especially the males. So they're hopping around between all these different caves, checking things out, enjoying the social scene uh, before they enter the long months of winter. And for especially for little brown bats, winter is the time of hibernation. So little brown bats only eat insects. Uh, you might've noticed that there's not a lot of insects flying around in the winter, so they can't eat. So what they do is they go into hibernation in some of these underground sites where the temperatures do not fall below freezing. Um, and then in order to survive the entire winter without eating, they have to really downgrade their energy use because they're living off their fat reserves. 
So they lower their body temperature to the ambient temperature of the cave. Um, so that can be in this area, generally around five or six degrees Celsius. Um, they suppress their immune system to a certain degree. Um, and then they cluster together for warmth. So these are actually Indiana bats uh, in Northeastern US. But you can see if bats are clustering like this during the winter, this is really great for disease transmission. We've been learning a lot of that with social distancing with COVID. So this is the opposite of that. They are not social distancing. They are really clustering together. And well, oops, we're frozen. Okay. Oh, there we go. So during winter is when white nose syndrome happens. Uh, this was first found in uh, Albany, New York, in a commercial cave, a tourist cave uh, in, let's see, I think it was 2006, as I recall. So white nose syndrome is caused by a fungus, uh, Pseudogermonathus destructans, and it's a very unusual fungus. When you think of fungal infections of your skin, you're usually thinking of things like athlete's foot, uh, other sort of dermatophytes like that, ringworm. These are all on the very surface of your skin and they don't actually penetrate into living tissue. They, they're using your dead skin cells on the surface of your skin for energy. But the white nose fungus will actually penetrate deep into the skin and it replaces uh, muscle fibers and blood vessels and their wings are full of holes. Um, so they die from a combination of starvation and dehydration because with the fungus uh, attacking your body like this, they'll often wake up more often during the winter and that really burns through their uh, energy reserves, their fat reserves. Uh, we think this fungus uh, originated in Europe or Asia. So the bats there also get white nose syndrome. They don't die from it. So a lot uh, milder uh, form of disease for them, uh, presumably because they've evolved with the disease over the centuries or millennia for that matter. So uh, this unfortunately is also an outdated map. They just released a new one a few days ago, um, but they started here with the red X in Albany and it just spread out from there. And actually it is now in Saskatchewan. That was the new, the latest news from uh, this past week uh, that it's shown up in Southern Saskatchewan now. Uh, so it is still spreading West and you can see it's all over the East coast of North America. Um, but it has not reached Alberta or British Columbia yet, to our knowledge. So this is just showing some of the damage the fungus does to bats. So on the right there is a normal healthy wing and the arrows are pointing to various structures that you'd expect in skin like muscles and blood vessels. But on the left is a bat that has been affected with white nose syndrome and the solid purple that's all fungal hyphae. So there's, there's no muscle left, none of the usual structures you'd expect. So of course you wouldn't think that a bat like that could effectively fly and hunt and find food. So they don't, when they have a heavy infection like this, they generally die from that. And this is uh, a little brown bat uh, that I took a photo of in New Brunswick in 2011. And you can see the fungus on the skin. So there's all these white, Dots. That's the fungus. You can see it's covered all the wings, the tail, the feet, and the ears. And of course, it covered the face as well. You just can't see it in this paper photo. This is also showing a bit more of what it does to the wings. So the black arrow is pointing to a part of the wing that's, uh, that's relatively un unaffected. So you can see it's sort of cool and still elastic. And the part of the wing where it's really done damage is all crinkly, and you can see some of the holes there. And clearly, this is not healthy. So white nose syndrome does not affect all bat species. So for example, the migratory bats uh, don't hibernate during the winter. They go south, so they don't get the disease. Um, and some species are less affected than others. So for instance, big brown bats do get the disease, but their mortality rate has only been about 30% compared to little brown bats and tricolored bats, uh, which are generally between 70 and 90% mortality from this disease. So some big differences there. We don't really understand why uh, some species uh, react differently than others. Uh, a lot of people are working on this question, including myself, um, and there's certainly a lot of different hypotheses of why we see these differences. Uh, but for now, the easiest answer is we don't. We don't really know.
we're working on it. So how do you combat this disease? Uh, when it was first starting, the biggest uh, effort was to try to slow down the spread. And as you see from the map, um, this wasn't hugely effective <laughs> as it spread all over pretty much. Um, but uh, the, this, this disease was thought to have spread initially from Eurasia to North America by people. So someone went into a cave in Eurasia, they had dirty boots or dirty gear or something. They came to this commercial cave in New York and spread the spores uh, by that method. So we're really trying to uh, stop people from uh, taking dirty gear from Eastern North America to Western North America, for instance, to try to prevent further spread of the fungus that causes this disease, and also other microbes that we don't even know about yet. Um, so trying to stay out of these caves and mines during the winter when bats are present, this also helps to uh, decrease disturbance of the bats because a lot of people go into these sites to have beer parties and they bring trash, uh, they leave trash all over the place um, in these, some of these sites and disturb the bats that are trying to hibernate over the winter. So that's definitely another thing that we're trying to prevent, uh, trying to tell people to stay out of these sites during the winter and leave the bats alone and trying not to trash the place. So what is the consequences of this disease? Um, usually, of course, uh, we want to know what are the consequences for us. Clearly the consequences to the bats themselves is not good with these huge mortality rates. Um, it was estimated between six and seven million bats have died. And that was that estimate was from 2012, actually. So it's quite outdated by now. Um, but in terms of us humans, uh, there are economic consequences because bats eat a lot of these agricultural and forestry pests, the insects. Um, it was estimated in one paper that bats provide four to $56 billion per year to the US agricultural industry. Uh, there is no such estimate for the Canadian industry, but you can imagine it might be uh, somewhat similar. Uh, yeah, our crops are a little different, but nevertheless. And then of course, when you're taking millions of individuals out of the system like this, you can also imagine that there might be consequences for the ecosystem, but generally we don't uh, really understand what the consequences of taking so many bats out of the landscape uh, are. That's something that uh, multiple people are looking at. It's not really part of my studies, uh, but keep an eye on the literature. So I wanted to look go over some of the research I did in New Brunswick. So I lived there for seven years uh, when white nose first came in. So it was really interesting, it was sad, but it was interesting to watch the effects of that. And I did all of this research with Donald McAlpine shown there at the New Brunswick Museum. So we started this work in 2009. So this is pre-white nose. So in this particular site, uh, this is Glebe Mine. Uh, we used to have a few hundred bats and we just go in and count how many are on the ceiling here. You can see all these individual bats hibernating during the winter. Um, and of course, when we did this work, we made sure to follow the decontamination uh, recommendations. So wearing, uh, certain gear, cleaning the gear between different sites to make sure that we kill off all the fungus and that sort of thing. Uh, in some of the sites, uh, there's a lot of water. So wading out into water like this in February is super fun. You can imagine just how uh, warm that water is, but the bats love to roost right over the water. Here are the bats up here. So that's what you have to do. And uh, for me, I love crawling through type spaces. I think this is really neat. Um, but a lot of people are sort of uh, horrified by shots like this showing the sort of places you have to go to find these bats during the winter. And this particular site's fun because it has a, a seven or eight foot drop, straight drop, it's like a chimney. Uh, and of course in the winter, it gets completely coated in ice. Um, so it's real easy to get in the site, not quite so easy to get out of the site. But we have ropes and uh, so far we've managed to get out just fine. And often during the winter in some of these sites, they're so uh, humid, you get a lot of these ice stalactites and stalagmites, which are always pretty to see. There's also tree roots in a lot of these caves. 
Um, I haven't seen those as much in Ontario, I have to say. They seem to be more common in uh, Quebec caves and Ontario caves, although I haven't done a systematic survey for that. It's just something I've kind of noticed. We did publish a paper about this, specifically about the uh, fungus associated with uh, tree roots and caves, which is pretty neat. Uh, one of the more interesting, well, well, more interesting to me is that we found a, a truffle uh, growing on some of these roots. So I don't know if you've ever been truffle hunting. Usually you're looking down at the ground and looking through leaves and stuff, but in here you're looking up. <laughs> They're above you, which is uh, a little weird, but it's how it is. Uh, we don't just do natural caves, uh, we also do uh, abandoned mines. Um, so those have a, a much more uniform look than natural caves. You get a lot of these old uh, wooden beams and artifacts that you can find in these places. And there's also uh, mushrooms that grow uh, in caves. These ones were pretty uh, neat. I just got, uh, saw those for trade after a manicure, so I thought that was a fun color contrast. There's also other mammals in caves, not just bats. So of course, this is a porcupine. We often saw these in some of our sites. Uh, and when I first started this work, I was always kind of worried going through some of these tight passages if I was gonna meet a porcupine who didn't appreciate my presence uh, and would tell me about it in no uncertain terms. But that actually didn't never happen. They were really uh, laid back. Uh, there was never any problem with them. And often they would uh, pose quite readily for uh, some pictures. So you can see this one, it's actually a younger uh, porcupine with his little pile of droppings. This is one of the older porcupines. If, if they didn't, if they'd had enough of us, they'd just sort of lumber off and show us their, their tails, um, but it was never a problem. There's also mice in these sites. So these are deer mice. Uh, they they're very fast, actually. They run around the, the cave ceilings, um, but this one stopped for a photo, which was very nice. And they also build uh, nests in these caves. You can see this giant nest the mice have built uh, near the ceiling of, in the mine here. And I actually did a study where I trapped the mice uh, to find out if they had the white nose fungus on them. Um, now, mice wouldn't get the disease itself because they don't hibernate. So the fungus will not grow above 20 degrees. So us as humans could never get the disease because our body temperature never gets that low. And neither could the mice. But nevertheless, I was wondered if they uh, were transmitting the fungus, if they could carry the fungus around to different places. But I didn't find the fungus on them at all. So I guess they don't. Um, another study I did was looking for the fungus on the cave walls. So I found that actually the fungus can persist on cave walls without bats for several years. But I was just back in these sites uh, this past April and uh, I didn't get a uh, fungus actually. So uh, it's now 2021 or 2022. Uh, and uh, it's been 11 years since White Nose first showed up in these sites. Um, and some of them haven't had bats in a decade now. So I'm not sure the white nose fungus can survive long-term without bats. It certainly can for a few years, but maybe not 11 years. Um, so that was quite interesting. The white nose fungus is also on various arthropods in these sites. So they're in the, some of these sites, there's a lot of spiders and moths, um, harvestmen flies, other species, um, and they also can transmit the fungus. They probably aren't getting the disease itself, uh, but they can move the spores around in the cave and potentially from cave to cave if the caves are close together. And these are some of the moths. Uh, these are tissue moths. This is actually from an Ontario cave. In New Brunswick caves, the herald moths, so the orange moth seems to be more common, but here in Ontario, it's more the tissue moths. Uh, I'm not sure why, but uh, I always thought they were quite nice. And this is a harvest moth uh, that got infected with a fungus, but this isn't the white nose fungus. This is called Bavaria, a well-known uh, pathogen of uh, insects. And you know, the, the fungus is the white stuff here. Uh, and you can see the spores growing out from the poor harvest moth. And this is just another harvest moth with the same thing. It's just a huge bundle of fungal spores at this point. So uh, we found, we first found whiteness syndrome in New Brunswick in 2011. We went in in March and this is what we found. So there was dead bats all over the cave floor. It was hard to walk without stepping on them, unfortunately, which was 
very depressing. So these are thousands of dead bats on the floor of the cave, uh, floating in the water in the cave, uh, stuck in the ice. Uh, so when they get this disease, a lot of them move to the cave entrances where they don't normally roost uh, because it's too cold, but they're in the ice area of the cave a lot of the time. And these are the counts of bats in the caves uh, where I worked in New Brunswick. So each color is a different cave. So the first cave where we found white nose uh, was called Barryton. It actually is this time here. It started at 6,000 bats, so way off the scale of this, but uh, it had huge mortality and it just collapsed immediately. You can see it going, going down here and it actually went to zero. So there were no bats left uh, in that particular site. And one by one, all of the uh, caves had white nose, had bats with white nose in them, and they all collapsed. But not all of them went to zero. Uh, some of them still had bats. So in winter 2015, 2015 um, we found 13 bats, uh, which was obviously a huge decrease from our previous counts. And um, I haven't updated this graph yet, but uh, I was at those sites this past April and we counted 19 bats. So it's better than 13 bats, but not by a lot. So they're not, the population isn't increasing very much. It's pretty much stabilized at this really low level, um, but at least there's still bats around. So that's nice to see. And the bats we saw were generally pretty healthy. Um, in two sites, we did see uh, bats still with the disease, um, but there's, it's really hard to imagine that they haven't been exposed uh, at this point when there's, the disease has been in the province for 11 years. Um, so that these guys are the survivors. For whatever reason, we don't know, uh, they are able to survive year after year with the disease. Um, so it's nice, it's nice to see that because uh, in the beginning, we were kind of worried that we'd get uh, uh, extinctions and so far that has not happened. Um, so you can still see bats in some of these sites, uh, like in Barryton Cave where we had these huge mortality events. Uh, it kind of looks like straw, but these are uh, the wing bones of bats all over the floor of the cave. Um, and you can still see that to this day. Um, it's still there. And just more uh, views, it gets a bat skull on the cave wall. And the huge mortality event did not go unnoticed by other animals. So raccoons actually came in here um, and ate a lot of the bat bodies. Uh, they don't generally like the wings because they not meat to them. So they often clip off the wings and eat the rest of the bat. You can see here, they sort of hollowed it out there. And they had quite the time during this event. And there's quite a variety of fungi that grow on these bats. So not just the white nose fungus, um, but once a bat dies, you, know, you don't have any immune defenses anymore. So a huge variety of fungi move in. Like this is white here. This isn't white nose syndrome. This is a species called mucor. It's a sugar fungi, sugar loving fungus that grows really fast and it's growing out of the, the face of this dead bat here. And over time, as the decomposition process continues, you get a lot of other different fungi. So you can see different types of molds on this bat. So here's the ears here, the head, this is the wing, and it's very colorful. And then in the end, um, the decomposition process continues and you get species like this, um, Microscus caviaris formis, it actually has a new name now, um, but all these ascospores you can see going out from the body of the bat. So to bring it back to bat boxes, one of the questions I'm trying to ask with the project is if the white nose fungus uh, is present in bat boxes. Um, not that the bats would get the disease in the summer, they don't because their body temperature is way too high, but potentially the fungus could be transmitted um, from bat box to bat box and then back into the caves and mines. So I'm trying to find out if its spores are present in some of these boxes. Now, this sort of study has been done in some parts of the USA, like Pennsylvania, and they did find the fungus in bat boxes there. Um, well, they found the DNA of the fungus, I should say. Um, so that's what I'm gonna start with. I'm starting with testing uh, swab samples to see if I can find the DNA of the white nose fungus. And if I do, I'm going to try to determine is if it's viable. Because if it's just uh, dead spores, we don't really care because that's not going to be infectious. 
uh, we wanted to determine if the fungus is actually viable in these bat boxes. So that will be the second step, assuming I get any positives. And we don't really have any results yet, uh, to be able to say one way or another. So those are all pending. But we certainly are getting uh, a lot of swab samples this summer. So this is just a lot of the different fungi I've cultured for bats over the years. That's been a lot of my research, just looking at the microbiome on bat skin. But I definitely won't get into that now. I think I've kept you long enough. So a big thank you to all of these individuals and organizations for supporting me over the years. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Karen. Wow, that was a lot of really interesting stuff. You've done a lot of really cool things. And I'm definitely one of those people that would not be crawling through those caves. So kudos to you. <laughs> So while we're waiting for questions, and of course, if you have any questions for Karen, please put them in the chat box and, and we'll, we'll ask her. Um, the What you're looking at now to see if it's viable or if it exists and if it's viable in those bat boxes. Um, and I don't know much about bat boxes, so please, please excuse me, but would it help if you were cleaning out your bat boxes? Um, Oh, I guess you really can't, can you? Because they use it year round. <laughs> no, uh, so bats will use them from as early as March in Southern Ontario uh, to about October. Um, okay. I'm, I don't think I've heard of anyone having a box in it in November, but no, they can't stay in the bat box because it's way too cold. They need places okay. that are above freezing. Like, uh, we can't tolerate being frozen. It goes very badly for us and the bats can't tolerate it either. Uh, they need above freezing conditions. So of course that's not in your bat box. Okay. So is it worth cleaning during that time when they're not in it then? Similar to like what you, you were saying with cleaning your gear and whatnot? Oh, for you mean decont decontamination. Yeah. So uh, at, at this point, I wouldn't worry about it. Like that's one of the points of doing the study is to see if, if that's something we should be right. uh, looking at. Um, but yeah, right now I don't have the answer because I, I don't know. Uh, Fair enough. But uh, the other way to interpret the question is cleaning it in terms of guano or insects. So for guano, you definitely don't need to worry about that. But for insects, uh, sometimes wasps will build uh, their nests in there or a lot of cocoons or spiders. Um, so once the bats leave, if you even have bats um, and once the insects leave, you might want to think about cleaning those out uh, in late fall, for instance. Good to know, okay. and. And there are lots of questions rolling in now. So um, would setting up back boxes in urban areas help the population? So potentially, because of course in urban areas, you don't have a lot of those big hollow trees that make for great bat habitat. Um, of course, in urban areas, there's also a lot of buildings. Um, so given the choice, bats will often choose an attic over a bat box, simply because the attic space is much bigger than your typical bat box. And in an attic, you're getting a lot of different microclimates at different temperatures, so the bats can choose what temperature they want based on the weather. So on a hot July day, they might want a cooler place. While in May, in the beginning of the May, when they're just coming out of hibernation, they're really looking for that hot stuff even though it's not very warm out yet. So they might be at the very top of your attic at that time of year. So for people that are trying to get bats out of their house, um, they often think that just putting up one little bat box is good, that's, that's all I need to do, but no. What you're trying to do is replicate or even improve upon the uh, risk conditions in your attic. So you want a multitude of bat boxes to try to give them that variation in temperatures and roosting location that they get in your attic. So one very successful example of this that you can actually uh, go look at is in Owenda Provincial Park, uh, if you're familiar with that. So I think it's on Huron, maybe it's Superior, I don't remember, that direction, north of Tobermore. Uh, they had a, a big bat colony in some of their staff buildings, which they didn't appreciate. So they put up 14 bat boxes, um, did the exclusion. So there's a humane way to exclude bats from your building, they did that. And now they have a huge little brown bat maternity colony in these 14 bat boxes. It's uh, about 800 individuals. So it's, a, it's an awesome example of a successful exclusion. Um, and now a lot of us researchers go there to study the population. Nice. Is that, that 8,000, is that a really large 
number or did I say a thousand? It should be. I don't know. Maybe I misheard. <laughs> but it's it's eight hundred, and yeah, that's that's a pretty good colony size. That is. So a couple questions now about what makes a good bat box. So ideal dimensions, what's the ideal height from ground level, ideal direction for it to face, anything else? So, so for the ideal height, um, I always thought uh, higher was better, but actually with the preliminary analysis of my data, that's not so. So it says, but according to my preliminary data, uh, it says between nine and 12 feet is the goal in my area. Um, you don't need to go much higher than that. Um, and But when I say stuff like this, it doesn't mean that if you have a box lower or higher than that, it's not going to be occupied. That's not always true. It's, there's not many hard and fast rules in biology, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, for instance, I know of a very successful uh, colony in Prince Edward Island where the boxes are about six feet from the ground, which normally we'd say is way too low, but the bats say, yeah, screw you. We love this place. And there's a, about a hundred bats in there. So you never know. Uh, in terms of the direction, so my preliminary analysis uh, indicates that actually direction does not matter. Uh, it does not matter at all. It's, it's never significant in any of my models. Um, I know a lot of uh, uh, people recommend like so facing south, for example, in terms of warmth. But according to my data, it doesn't matter. So put it whatever direction you want for now. Um, in terms of dimensions, uh, bigger is better. That's, that's really the best thing I can say. Um, I, again, uh, the number of chambers, I always consider that to be very important. And, and it is, but it's not as important as the overall dimensions of the box. So you could have like a two chambered box or for you and say, no, 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 you need more chambers than that. But if it's really a huge box, it works. It can be very successful. Um, there's a lot of different um, bat box plans online you can look at. Uh, bat Conservation International, Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, the British Columbian government has a really great bat site with a lot of information and bat box plans that you can look at. And any of those plans, is there one that's the best, the go-to? Um, I, I mean, a lot of people deviate from them. Uh, like in terms of the be best bat box ever, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> we're still, that's still part of the project that we're looking at. <laughs> But when you have that answer, you'll make sure to let us know, right? It'll be in my newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> so Rick said he sent in a fecal sample last year, but he actually never heard back about what species it was from. Yeah, uh, so we're not actually expecting results from that until maybe next month. So we send those samples off to a lab, and the lab has been very backed up with COVID testing um, and um, shipping problems and all this sort of thing. So we don't have any results from guano analysis yet. Once we start getting in that data, and again, I don't really know when that's gonna happen, um, we'll definitely start contacting people, those results. Okay, and that was that was actually the last question. We'll give everyone a minute more. Oh, should bat boxes be away from trees? Um, to some degree. Um, the problem with being really close to trees is then the bat box gets shaded and, and we are still recommending that it try to be more exposed to the sun. Um, but something you can do, is, especially depending on uh, what your house is like, like you could have a bat box in the full sun if you can, and then have a bat box in the shade so that the bats can move around depending on the temperature outside. If it's a cold day, they might go to the, the box in the sun. If it's a warm day, they might like Nowadays here, uh, they might move to the bat box in the shade. And so in that case, you can, you can have it closer to the trees. One of the reasons we don't like them on the tree um, is a lot of the times branches are blocking the entrance of the, of the box. So when bats are exiting a box, especially pregnant females or females carrying pups, like they, they go down and they need a moment to sort of catch the air and swoop back up. So if there's a branch there, that doesn't work very well. As the box is on a tree, the other problem is it's a lot more accessible to predators. So domestic cats, raccoons, they will all try to get the bats out of the box to eat them. Uh, so that's another reason not to have them on trees. Uh, hours of sun, I have no idea yet. <laughs> that's also part of the study, so we'll find out. I've seen 
them freestanding. You showed a couple pictures of them. And then of course on, on buildings. Have you found that there's a preference for one over the other? Buildings. Buildings? Yeah. That's not to say that there aren't uh, many successful boxes on poles. There are. It's just that there are more successful boxes on buildings. On buildings. Um, what are the natural predators of bats? So owls will certainly eat them. Um, well, domestic cats, I guess, aren't really natural. Um, but at pretty much anything that can get their hands, so to speak, on them. So uh, bats come out generally after dark or just at dusk. And during that time, like just from dusk to full dark, uh, hawks will often try to get them as well uh, until it's too dark for the hawks to see anymore. So that's also a natural predator. Um, there's actually a huge variety of animals that will eat them in caves. Um, that's why it's really important that the bats choose a good roosting site to need to be high up off the floor. Uh, in some of the tropical caves, you can, and you can find these videos on YouTube, it's really interesting. Sometimes you'll have snakes hiding out at the entrance to caves that uh, shoot out and grab bats in midair as they're exiting the cave at night, which is, it, it's really fascinating for me actually watching these videos. Uh, but I've never heard of that happening in Canada. Uh, our snakes are not as big. <laughs> All right, I don't see anything else rolling in. We'll give it a couple more seconds. Um, and in the meantime, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is being recorded. Uh, the plan is to post it to our YouTube channel, hopefully sooner rather than later, but you have to uh, forgive us. We don't currently have anyone who has video, video editing skills. So it takes a little while and and I guess maybe a shameless plug, if anyone on this, this talk has um, has those skills and would be willing to help us out, please send me an email. I'd really appreciate it. Um, otherwise, yeah, Rick, I agree. Thank you for a very informative talk, Karen. It's been, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I have, I put the links in the chat um, for the Canadian Bat Box Project, Bat Watch, I will send an email out that also has those in it, as well as um, maybe Karen's contact information, if you're okay with that. And then if anyone's interested in, in becoming involved in the project, they can reach out to her and get more information. All right, well then with that, thank you again. And uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening.